So today we are going to learn about the rise of Napoleon and the Empire of France. We have three daily objectives. Number one, explain how Napoleon became Emperor of France. Number two, list the reforms that Napoleon enacts. And number three, describe the mistakes that Napoleon made that lead to his ultimate defeat. So we talked about the French Revolution. Uh, previously, the French Revolution, remember, is inspired by the Enlightenment and ultimately leads to the overthrow of the absolute monarchy under Louis XVI in France and the establishment of a republic, um, the creation of the Declaration of Rights of Man, which, which guarantees certain natural rights to all French citizens. Um, all the while, we have the Reign of Terror going on, where people are, royalists especially, are captured and executed, beheaded by the guillotine. We talked about the war that is waging between France and, and the rest of Europe um, in an effort to restore the French monarchy because the other kings and queens of Europe are afraid that this revolution, inspired by the Enlightenment, might spread to their own countries. So at this point, France is a republic. In comes Napoleon Bonaparte. Let's talk about Napoleon. So this is the handsome Napoleon over here on the right. So Napoleon is born on the island of Corsica, which is an island in the Mediterranean Sea, generally considered part of Italy, though it does still belong to France where Napoleon attended a military school. Napoleon is actually Italian. He is not French, just FYI. Um, he joins the army of the new government, so the Republic, uh, at the beginning, right at the beginning of the French Revolution, the beginning of the French Republic. Um, and he is shortly thereafter named the hero of the Republic because he stops a royalist counter coup in October 1795. So some royalists were actually trying to bring back the monarchy. Um, the war between Europe and the, monarch, the monarchies of Europe, uh, between, I'm sorry, France and the monarchies of Europe continued. Um, Napoleon was made a general and actually won a series of victories in Italy as general of some of the French armies. So Napoleon is then sent to Egypt. Egypt at this point is a colony of Great Britain, um, and he is trying to capture some of the trade routes down in North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean. He does fail in this endeavor. But upon returning to France at the behest of some of his friends, some of the rich bourgeoisie who have taken over the French Republic, um, Napoleon establishes himself as dictator of France. He successfully defeats the European monarchs and forces them to sign a peace treaty. This peace is not going to last very long. They're still terrified of Napoleon, and they're terrified of the revolution in France. This is a map of um, this is a map of Europe right before Napoleon goes on a conquering spree. We can see France is pretty big. This is Corsica actually right here. Um, Italy's still broken into pieces. Holy Roman Empire is still hanging around barely. We've got Spain down in the south. So some of the reforms that Napoleon enacts as dictator of France. First off, he sets up a public banking system and actually improves tax collecting. He needs money because he's about to go back to war. Um, he creates state-run and paid-for schools for all boys. This is a huge deal. You've got public schools for really the first time in Europe. It's only for boys, but it is a step in the right direction. Um, boys could go and earn, a, earn an education free of charge, and if they do really well in school, they could even get a job in, in the government. Um, this is really good because the government is being built around merit, so how smart you are, how successful you are. And not by birth, not because your dad was a duke or a count or something. You're going into government because you're smart and you should be in government. You should be making decisions. He actually writes the Napoleonic Code. The Napoleonic Code is both good and bad. It's good because it sets up a uniform set of laws for all French citizens. It's bad because it limits free speech and it actually restores slavery to the French colonies. In 1794, Napoleon crowns himself Emperor of the French Empire with the support of the Catholic Church and the Pope. This is a big deal because no longer is he a dictator, no longer is who's going to be in charge next up in the air. It's for sure that Napoleon's children are going to succeed to the throne after him, and this is him in his imperial regalia. Let's talk about foreign policy. So Napoleon goes on a conquering spree. He starts conquering Europe left and right. Why is he able to do this? One, he's a military genius. Two, remember nationalism? Well, French people are super proud of being French. They are proud of the French nation. 
and they want to go and they want to prove to everyone else how awesome it is to be French. They want to bring the revolution to the rest of Europe and the rest of the world, and they do that by the point of the gun. So one of the first things Napoleon does is he actually sells Louisiana to the United States in what is called the Louisiana Purchase. He does this because he needs the money to fight lots of wars against the other European countries and because he knows this will set the United States up as potentially a rival against England, which it does successfully. Um, he uses the money from the Louisiana Purchase to declare war on all of the European monarchs. He conquers the vast majority of them and installs what are called puppet governments or puppet states in their pit place. Basically, you can see Spain down here is one of these puppet states, dependent states in light blue. Basically, what that means is that the government of Spain is still there. So technically, it is independent. It is its own country. But Napoleon is telling the government of Spain what to do. They are, by all intents and purposes, under the control of Napoleon. So almost all of Europe has become under the control of Napoleon. Some of Europe is under the direct control. So we can see parts of Italy. We can see parts of, um, at this point, Hung Hungary and Austria. We can see parts of Germany. These, are come, these have become under the direct control of Napoleon. All of these purple countries are allies of Napoleon. Now, some of them want to be allies. Some of them are being forced to be allies. But they are all allies. That includes Austria, Hungary, and Prussia. Um, almost all of Europe is under the command of Napoleon, except for Great Britain, Portugal, and the Ottoman Empire down here in the south. So Napoleon almost unifies Europe for the first time since the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, which is kind of a big deal. So costly mistakes. There's a number of mistakes he makes that ultimately lead, uh, lead to his downfall and the downfall of the French government of Napoleon. The first is he fails to defeat England. England's over there on their island. They're kind of poking Napoleon in the eye every chance they get. England's got the biggest navy in the world at this point, so it's hard for Napoleon to get the stuff coming from the colonies that are super important. His failure to beat England, the, his failure to beat, beat Great Britain, realize they're the same thing, um, kind, of, kind of leaves England and Great Britain as the leader of the anti-Napoleon countries. So the failure to beat England is one of the most important reasons why Napoleon ultimately fails. Second reason is the Peninsular War. So Napoleon decides that Spain should now be under the control of his brother. His brother should be the king of Spain. He loves his brother. Um, he spends almost 300,000 French lives trying to make Spain under the rule of his brother, and this ultimately fails. Nationalism which has been a great thing for France and Napoleon up to this point, ends up biting Napoleon in the butt. All of these countries that, are, that have been conquered by Napoleon, they're like, wait, I live in Austria. I'm Austrian. I'm proud to be Austrian. I want an Austrian to be in charge of me, not some guy in France. Same thing's happening in Italy. Same thing's happening in Germany. Same thing's happening across Europe. So what starts out as a great thing for the French, for the French a great thing for Napoleon, nationalism turns into their ultimate demise. And finally, he brings an army of approximately 420,000 soldiers into Russia during the winter, and only 10,000 return. This is a painting of some of his soldiers returning. This is ultimately the thing that leads to Napoleon's downfall. He loses so much of his army in Spain and Russia, and combined with nationalism, all of the countries of Europe rise up against him and establish their own governments. So seizing upon these failures, Britain, Russia, Prussia, Sweden, and Austria all come together and declare war on Napoleon. Because all of Napoleon's most experienced soldiers had died in Spain and Russia, Napoleon is defeated. They exile him on the island of Elba and restore the French monarchy. So the Bourbons are back in charge. Within three months, interestingly enough, Napoleon returns to France, raises another army, and is again emperor of France. But he is again defeated by the other European countries at the Battle of Waterloo, and he dies six years later, um, once again exiled. A lot of rumors that he was poisoned, but there is no evidence to prove that he was poisoned, but that would make sense. This is a painting of the Battle of Waterloo, where Napoleon and the French ultimately lose to the Allied European powers. So ultimately, after the fall of Napoleon, um, we have to figure out what the world's going to look like from now on. So this is what Europe looks like in 1812. This is the height of Napoleon's power. 
This is a result of the Congress of Vienna of 1815. Congress of Vienna is where all the European powers come together at Vienna, which is in Austria, and they decide what Europe's going to look like and what the world's going to look like now that Napoleon is gone. You're going to notice that France gets a little smaller. Um, Austria-Hungary gets a lot of land because they were one of the winners. Prussia gets a lot of land because they were one of the winners. Um, you got this weird kingdom of Hanover, um, which is largely restored, as you can see. It doesn't really change a whole lot. Um, Italy gets broken back up into pieces as it was. Spain is free once again, as is Great Britain. But this peace, this is an attempt at peace in Europe. It's not going to last very long. And ultimately, all of this is going to change with the reunification, with the unification, I'm sorry, of Germany and Italy, which is coming a little bit later as a result of nationalism. Take a few minutes, answer your three daily objectives.